Welcome to Too Complicated for History. I am Isaac S. Loftus, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Lynn Price Robbins. Hey there. We come to you twice a month, bringing you the history information that fell through the cracks of your curriculum. And today, we have a particularly fascinating subject to talk about. When you think of a spy, uh, a job that a spy has, you know, I think of diplomat, um, you know, someone in tech, someone involved and connected uh, in the government world. I don't really think of a botanist. That's not the first thing that comes to mind. But our guest today uh, has written a book about someone who did just that, went from botanist to spy. Yes, we're super excited to have as our guest today, Dr. Patrick Spiro, who is the incoming chief executive officer of the American Philosophical Society and the author of Scientist Turned Spy, Andre Michaud, Thomas Jefferson, and the Conspiracy of 1793. Thanks so much for being here today with us, Pat. I'm thrilled to be here. So where are you coming from today? Yeah, I am streaming in from the American Philosophical Society, uh, which, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Uh, what Franklin wanted to do in 1743 was he realized that the North American colonies were beginning to build a bunch of institutions to support their society, and, and they needed an institution that would bring together the leading thinkers in the colonies who are spread apart in Boston and Georgia and Philadelphia and Williamsburg, Virginia, bring them together and share what they're learning with each other so they can improve their own communities and also share these discoveries with the rest of the world. So we've been doing that, promoting knowledge, advancing research since 1743, almost 300 years. And wow. I'm sitting right now right outside of the vault uh, where we have over 14 million pages of manuscripts. Um, 70% of Franklin's correspondence is here, and we also have the Lewis and Clark journals, Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, Benjamin Franklin's annotated copy of the Constitution. It's, it's really a world heritage site, if you were to ask me, all the history that's oh contained gosh. here. <laughs> Wait, did you say 14 million? I'm drooling. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, and, and we collect, we continue to collect. We have over seven Nobel laureates uh, in the his history of science is one of our core areas of collecting, along with early American hmm. history. Uh, and Native American history. So it's a very eclectic, wide-ranging uh, uh, collection itself. And the institution itself, we provide over $2 million of research grants a year to young scholars, some of whom are coming here, but even more are going out around the world in all different fields, conducting field work and research. Amazing. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I'm, I'm out here uh, and I'm telling you the history of the, of the APS and, and all that we do. And, and in some ways, the, the origins of this book uh, is because of the history of the APS, uh, the inspiration that I find in it. And there was actually one document in particular, a document that had, had fascinated me. I was, I, before my current position, I was librarian of the APS, so I was the steward of this remarkable collection. And there was one document that was one of my favorites, but I also didn't know a lot about it. So during the pandemic, I decided, well, maybe I should actually research this document to fully understand its, its history. And the next thing I know, I'm writing a book about, as Isaac said, this botanist turned spy who really is uh, trying to undermine the very foundations of the American Republic and the Washington administration itself. It's a, it's a remarkable story. And see, some good things did come out of the pandemic. And I think we've heard this a lot on yeah. our podcast that a lot of researchers said, you know what, when I didn't have to do all that other stuff. I really got a lot of good research done. So now we're seeing the fruits of that. And of course, your book is one of them. Um, so what are you, what are you going to show us today? That yeah, is so, so important? I have pulled out that inspiration for you all. Uh, what you're looking at is a national treasure. Uh, mm. It is called the Andre wow. Michaud subscription list. And for those yes. of you uh, that aren't listening or watching on YouTube, but are listening on your headphones uh, on the podcast, um, this is a parchment uh, piece of paper uh, written in 18th century scrawl um, and cursive. Uh, and what's remarkable, and you're going to hear me say remarkable a lot, because this story, this document, it, I found it absolutely not only fascinating, but remarkable. Um, it is in Thomas Jefferson's hand. So this top section oh. here is in Thomas Jefferson's hand. And this is what it says. And I'll read uh, the key parts. Andre Michaud, a native of France and inhabitant of the United States, has undertaken to explore the interior country of North America from the Mississippi 
along the Missouri and westwardly uh, to the Pacific Ocean. So this is Lewis and Clark. This is 1793, 10 mm -hmm. years before Lewis and Clark. Wow. And what it says is the said philosophical society, so if you look in the middle here, um, mm -hmm. will uh, raise the money to underwrite this expedition. And then beneath Thomas Jefferson's hands, he brought this out to all APS members and leaders of the Republic, uh, the founders of our country, to say, do you want to support this initiative? And beneath here, you can see George Washington's signature, oh John gosh. Adams' signature, Thomas Jefferson's signature, and James Madison's signature. So these are the first four president's signatures. And it also includes people like Alexander Hamilton, Henry Knox. It's really a who's who of the founding. And the most remarkable part of this story is that this document itself was not discovered or rediscovered, I guess I should say, until 1979 when a what? high school intern was going through a, the vault of the APS. He found this cache of documents. He didn't know what they were. He brought them to the librarian's desk who unfurled this and realized he had a national treasure on his hands. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine? <sighs> Are there any other documents that have the signature of all four the first four presidents in existence? I can't imagine that there are many, if there are any. No, thanks, Isaac. That is, I think, one of the other, I mean, remarkable is the word I just overuse when I talk about this document, <laughs> because this is believed to be the only document to have their first four president's signatures on it, because they all weren't at the Declaration, they all weren't at right. the Constitution. So if, can you imagine being that intern uh, coming across this, and now this is, you know, um, well, it, it tells an incredible story, and it tells the story that I just told you, but it was during the pandemic that I wanted to dive deeper. I wanted to ask, well, who is this Andre show? What's the story of the APS and this raising these funds, and, and what happened? Um, right. And that's, you know, I, at first it was kind of, I was going to give a brief talk, and the next thing I know, I'm writing this book, and I'm sucked into this incredible story that takes so many different twists and turns. This episode of Too Complicated for History is brought to you by our supporters over on Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and join the conversation, our membership is completely free. And that gives you access to our Discord, which is a place for like-minded history fans and even some of the historians that we've interviewed to just chat, hang out, and ask interesting questions. Our paid tiers give you access to exclusive content, live streams, and even signed book giveaways. Check it out today at patreon.com slash primary source media. That's patreon.com slash primary source media. Pat should put it in a graphic right about here. Now let's get back to the show. Yeah, it sounds so. Just even judging from the title of the book, um, you know, the conspiracy of of 1793 yeah. and the fact that we're talking about Michaud as a spy, it seems like there's a a lot between like, hey, go west and study stuff, for, to to where you where he ended up. Um, can you give us some context as to who Michaud was? Because you, you know he's he was a botanist and obviously right. a, a French citizen. Um, and this who, is before, who was this guy? yeah, and this was before the Lewis and Clark, which I is the famous, you know path to the west to the yeah. pacific ocean so we have to remember so this cool. is before them there was this botanist and so who was he yeah um you know one of the dangerous things is, is asking somebody that just wrote a book uh questions <laughs> like that because <laughs> yeah. bore your listeners uh with uh the, the story um but every aspect of Michaud's life uh you know I, you just get sucked into it i've met some other people you know Michaud's not well known but those who have studied him just had so much admiration and respect for all that he did. Um, mm. Michaud, you know, he was born um, in France outside of Versailles, and he had a very kind of staid path laid out for him. He was going to be a farmer. His father owned, a, uh, had some property at Versailles. Um, he was going to pass that on to his son. Uh, but Michaud, um, through a, a, you know, a, unexpected events, soon discovered that he had this natural aptitude at science. He, be, he becomes mm. a protege of some of the leading scientists in France. Mm. And they take him under their wing. He did not expect to become a botanist. Uh, so much of his life is about the unexpected happening to him and him seizing opportunities uh, that are presented to him. Hmm. You know, he was born on a stable farm, uh, a middle class family outside of Versailles. Um, his father uh, expected that he would just follow in his father's footsteps and continue the tradition of, of being a, a farmer. Uh, uh, and we show... Um, follows that path, and then um, he marries, uh, he begins a f starts a family, and then his wife dies very young, and Michaud is very, you know, he has a, he's an infant son, and he's really thrown into this deep depression, and all of his friends and neighbors 
are worried about Michaud. They're, they're concerned he might do something drastic um, with, you know, in his mourning and his grief. And so one of his neighbors uh, happens to be one of the leading scientists in France who's uh, at Versailles, has a botanical garden at Versailles, knows about Michaud as a farmer, and takes him under his wing and gives him some experiments to do on his small farm. And Michaud shows this incredible aptitude, this natural aptitude for botanical research. Uh, he has, I think, this incredible mind and this memory that you know is necessary in the 18th century when you're in the field looking at plants and identifying the species. And so the next thing you know, he leaves his farm. He starts studying uh, both in Paris and then he goes to London. And the next thing you know, he's traveling across Persia uh, to the Caspian Sea and is one of the first French scientists to travel through Persia to the Caspian Sea. Uh, he returns laden with all these treasures and the French king realizes this uh, Michaud's skill and says, you know what, I want you to be the royal botanist. And for Michaud, this is, you know, exactly what he's looking for. He's thrilled. And for Michaud, he wants to return back east. He wants to travel to Tibet mm -hmm. and other areas in the east. He's fascinated with what he saw there and he knows there's more to discover. And, and the French king says, no, 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 not east west young man <laughs> you're going across the Atlantic <laughs> to, to north america um and the reason why is that the france uh, it's for it's for national uh, strategic purposes it's in their national interest hmm. because france has supported the american revolution because they fought this war against great britain in the 1750s their forests have essentially been depleted and this is a uh, an emergency because they don't have enough woods to sustain their military and so we show his task with discovering um, new species of plants in North America. This has been British controlled area. So the French haven't had a lot of access to it and especially to identify trees and oaks in particular that can replenish French forests. So that's how Michaud, you know, born on a small farm outside of Versailles, finds himself in the United States right after the American Revolution, 1785. Uh, yeah, you answered my question uh, as you were telling the story. I had a question pop into my head, but you already answered it was you know, a royal botanist is, serves what purpose? I mean, it can, yeah. you know, in my, in, but that now that makes a ton of sense um, uh, that, that it was, it was a, of a national um, strategic purpose. Yeah. And it's, um, so he's well cool. known, right? Well, he's, he's well known he, in France. He's, he's, he's moderately a... well known. Um, he's well okay. connected, uh, but he's certainly not mm -hmm. in that kind of upper echelon of French scientists. And, you know, in fact, one of okay. Michaud's constant frustrations, one of which, feeds directly into his work with the APS is he wants to be a pure scientist. He wants to study, mm. uh, you know, botany, the natural world for its own sake and to make discoveries for their own sake. But everybody in the 18th century, arguably today uh, for funding, you have to rely on funders. And in France, it's the patronage right. of the king and he has to follow the king's priorities. And this is one of a constant refrain of Michaud that, you know, he's always struggling between what he wants to do with what the people with money want him to do. Yeah. I mean, yep. that's, it's a tale as old as time. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but so, so he's, when he arrives in North America, does he um, just get to studying? Is it, is it, is he successful in this? Like what is his uh, initial sort of foray yeah. into North America look like? Yeah. So he, so he lands in New York city and um, his initial plan is that he's going to create a botanical garden outside of New York city. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, he starts to explore the area. To be honest, as I talk about in the book in greater detail, he's, he's kind of underwhelmed with New York City, in fact. Um, he finds that there aren't a lot of scientists, but there are a lot of people who are chasing after money, not knowledge. <laughs> and, um, but nonetheless, also a tale uh, as he as does time. create a botanical garden in New Jersey. And this is fascinating because New Jersey does not allow... Um, uh, non-U.S. citizens to own property. And here's the French king who wants to buy a piece of property and open a botanical garden. So Michaud has to get an act of the New Jersey legislature to permit him to purchase land on behalf of the king. And so the king of France actually owned a piece of New Jersey to create a, a very early botanical garden in the country's history. But Michaud does not like the Northeast. He does not like the North. And he eventually settles in uh, South Carolina, Charleston, where he opens up a 110-acre botanical garden. So Michaud's actually operating two botanical gardens, one in New Jersey and one in Charleston, South Carolina. So it sounds like a botanist dream to run two huge botanical gardens. I mean, he must have been happy with that, but he still wanted to 
travel? Did he still want to, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't satisfied with those. He still wanted to travel and find new, new plants and new items. Is that right? No, exactly. So, you know, his, his, um, the King's orders are, of course, you know, he's got to find um, trees to replenish uh, uh, France, but, but it's broader than that. Right. The idea is that in North America, there may, there are undiscovered plants, crops that could actually really help transform France's economy uh, their agriculture to really improve society in France. So even though you know he's got this top priority, he all, he does have a, a, a long leash. And what Michaud ends mm-hmm. up doing is um, taking an expedition, uh, usually in the springtime, every year in these initial years. And he travels through Florida. He travels through the Southeast. He travels uh, all throughout uh, the Mid Atlantic. And over the course of his time in uh, the United States, he discovers botanists estimate that he discovered over a thousand new species of uh, uh, plants, as well as shipping Whoa. across 50 to 60,000 living specimens to France. And this is a big part of the book is his travel journals, which are held by the APS as well. Uh, they, they read like, you know, this compelling travel narrative. He's fending off alligators. He's, you know, navigating marshes. Uh, he's traveling to the Bahamas. It's really a remarkable story. It sounds like I mean, we need a movie of this. I'm sorry. I just I, I was imagining yeah. that in my head and thinking I, I would like to see these these travels. Yeah. No. Uh, and so uh, his probably his most daring expedition um, was to the Hudson Bay. And this came after the French Revolution. So after uh, hmm. the king lost his head, Michaud lost his patron. And. Um, oh, that makes sense. Many, and, and he's getting called back to France, in fact. And this is kind of the, the very early days of the terror. And Michaud does not want to go back to France. You know, he, he first off, he doesn't think his mission's completed. Yeah. He also isn't sure about his own future, having been the royal botanist. Um, so he ends up raising uh, funds himself. Uh, in fact, uh, he sells some of those that he enslaved to fund an expedition to the Hudson mm. Bay. And this mm. is, um, you know one of the most daring expeditions I think anybody had taken in, in this in this era. Uh, he travels with a small group of indigenous guides. Um, he's traveling in, in August, late August. And as he gets closer to Hudson Bay, the weather starts to turn. And in his journal, he's documenting the fact that they have to race back to beat winter. Um, and so it is, uh, mm-hmm. it just reads, I mean, every expedition he takes uh, is just you know, when he's in Florida, he's traveling through the, 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 the swamps of Florida and they're running out of food and they have to find food and forage for food and the like. And um, it's it's just truly remarkable. And there's so many small stories and I can't tell them all in this book, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, those are two remarkably different yeah. <laughs> challenges to take right. place. Yeah. Um, and it, just for the context of our listeners, I, I think the, the, the mission, the fact that there are plants to discover um, and those things, I think, can be a little bit. We can th- sort of take for granted how much we know about the natural world, even mm-hmm. though we are researching, you know, places like in the Amazon and 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 finding new species every um, every year. This uh, even today, but back then they were world changing stuff. Like like the potato right. is not native to Europe. Like that is a North American plant that was mm-hmm. brought over there and changed essentially the base diets of an, almost the whole continent. Um, so like they were like, you know, big swings. They could have like world changing things that he was out there to discover. Yeah. And this is actually, yeah. I mean, this is part of the enlightenment project. We have letters from other French scientists talking about Michaud's work and how it can transform the world, transform France. Mm. Uh, Michaud sends over cranberries. He sends over sweet potatoes. Now these were probably mm. known before Michaud, but he's trying to, really push, hey, these might help us. We should explore these. He thinks the cranberry might be good in one area of France. Um, so this really mm-hmm. is transformative work. And it's not just me show. I mean, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, after the American Revolution, there's this incredible international exchange of seeds um, in which it's also coming mm-hmm. to the United States. You know, Michaud helps introduce um, uh, some of the, some flowers into uh, Charleston that hadn't yet been kind of domesticated, if you will. So it is a, glo- it's, it's a Western initiative. Um, uh, and, and it is an idea that, that plants can change the world, can improve society. And we're now living with that yeah, legacy. And it the- seems commonplace, but it was world changing at the time. Right. Yeah. And he's at the tip of the spear yeah. of all of this, um, which is super neat. So how did, um, 
he end up setting his sights westward from even even yeah. those things? Because you've you described basically a path that is go, goes very far north and very far south, mm-hmm. but not very far west so far. Right. Yeah. So you know, that's uh, exactly where after the Hudson Bay um, expedition, uh, he's in Canada, I think. You know, and he actually takes some time in Canada. He's trying to avoid having to go back to France. And he's looking at all that he had studied. And it really was east of the Mississippi. He'd covered almost all that ground. And he's looking at this map and he's heard some things in Canada about what's west of the Mississippi River. He's seen some animal specimens that some French traders had that were unknown to him. And so he strikes on this idea that, you know what, the last great project for him in North America is to do this continental expedition, to be the first person to do it. And of course, this is in the ether. Um, Thomas Jefferson had been thinking about this since the 1780s himself, and he'd even tried to raise money to do it himself in this earlier period of time. So Michaud, who is well Im- immersed in American society, he's friends, w- he meets with Benjamin Franklin, he stays over at George Washington's house, he's well integrated in, with the leading scientist in America, he realizes that in Philadelphia, there's this philosophical society that's like the Royal Society in Great Britain or like the French Academy of Science, this institution that's mission is to promote new knowledge. And so he strikes on this idea that, you know what, he doesn't have the money anymore to do this expedition, but this APS, the American Philosophical Society, might underwrite this expedition. So instead of going home after the Hudson Bay, he decides to go to Philadelphia to pitch this idea to APS members. Oh, okay, so in. I this is a silly question, but the first thing I heard when you said that is, oh, he's going to get a PowerPoint. Yeah. <laughs> he's going to talk about what he's going to do. So do you know anything about the actual pitching process and what, I mean, we know the outcome, but can you tell us about, you know, how it went when he went to pitch it and what the outcome yeah, was? Yeah, so in December, um, and, and, and some of us reading between the lines, but what we know is in December, uh, he met with several leading uh, APS members in Philadelphia and he told them basically what I just said, you know, he's done all of this. He's traveled very light. He, he's confident. He always travels just with two or three people. Lewis and Clark had a, had a large expedition. He always travels three, four yeah. people, often uh, indigenous guides. Sometimes um, some of his enslaved uh, workers are botanists. He's trained them to work with him. Um, so he goes to the APS and yeah. says, you know, I can do this. I just need the, the money to, to underwrite it. And the, you know, the, the APS members he pitches it to, uh, the Bartrams, uh, Benjamin Smith Barton, they say, mm-hmm. wow, you know, this is this is in our thinking, too. Um, and we know just the person to help mobilize this. It's Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, at this point in time, is the secretary of state of the United States. But he's also the vice president of the American Philosophical Society. And as you probably know, Jefferson is kind of feels a little uncomfortable in the Washington administration, kind of like maybe he's a, a, an outlier in the administration, uh, doesn't share a lot of the same ideas as Hamilton. And so the APS had really become uh, Jefferson's outlet. Um, it had been his intellectual home. Um, there's a joke uh, that he maybe spent more time at the APS than he did uh, anywhere else in Philadelphia at the time. And um, and so they come to Jefferson and Jefferson hears uh, Michaud, uh, learns about Michaud's background and says, you know, I think this might be the moment. This guy can do it. Let's do it. And that's where he starts to organize the APS to raise the money to underwrite uh, the expedition. And that's what the subscription list is, correct? Yep. The subscription list is about raising the money, right? Exactly. So uh, the APS says, uh, the first thing we have to know if we, we can raise the money, uh, and they do, right. uh, and they exceed it. And the APS uh, creates three committees, one a task with raising the money, another one to collect the money. And then the third one uh, is to outline the instructions for Michaud. And the third one is actually, to me, the most interesting because this is, um, and each one is uh, the members that are, are put on it, you know, they're good at the, the, the fundraising one are the people that are the most well-connected. Um, the one for the um, instructions are the leading scientists, but they're not really fundraisers. Uh, and Jefferson, uh, alongside David Rittenhouse, Casper Wistar, Benjamin Rush, they're all in this um, uh third committee. And what's fascinating mm-hmm. is the instructions that they create for Michaud. Well, there's two things. First off, they create real friction with Michaud. But I think more interestingly is they really become a first draft for Lewis and Clark. And the editors of the papers of Thomas Jefferson have compared the instructions to Michaud side by side with the instructions that they gave Lewis and Clark. And it's clear that when Thomas Jefferson gives the instructions to Meriwether Lewis in 1803, 
he is referring back directly to what he wrote for me show. Oh, wow. Huh. You said that there was some friction. Yeah. Um, what, what was that? What was that friction yeah. like? So yeah. as, they're, as they're building instructions and directive. Yeah. So this is the, you know, this is such a complicated story and there are so many different things going on at the same time. So the APS is moving headlong with this expedition, raising the money, creating the instructions. Now Michaud, uh, you know, is the royal botanist. He's a Frenchman. He is deeply loyal to mm. France. Um, his specific politics might sometimes be hard to, to get at, but no matter what, he is always loyal to France. And so as things get closer, he starts thinking, huh, if I'm paid by the American Philosophical Society, is that going to be a betrayal of my national loyalties and responsibilities? And uh, so he starts getting in these protracted negotiations with the APS, which I won't bore the listeners with, but are in the book, um, really that are, that are about what rights the APS has to n- the knowledge he discovers, what we might think of intellectual property and what rights he mm-hmm. has. And this creates hmm. you know, a protracted negotiation. And it's because these negotiations take on so long that Michaud's entire expedition is completely redirected by that conspiracy that is a part of the subtitle of my book. Ooh. So redirect. So they, they're able to get past some of that, that initial friction because the expedition is redirected. So he, he sets off, right? He, he, he starts it moving forward with, with his uh, moving west and, and as part of this, correct? Not precisely. Not okay. <laughs> so he, yeah, so he doesn't get off to a good start. Well, this is where the the espionage uh, and, and the intrigue uh, re- really happens. So Michaud yeah. is sitting in Philadelphia, late April, early May of 1793, trying to figure out: Should he do this expedition? Should he not? Can they come to terms? Can they not? It's it's a real stalemate. Okay. And then all of a sudden, a French ambassador appears in Philadelphia, the first ambassador mm. representing the French revolutionary government, Edmund Genet. And Genet has mm. with him secret instructions. Um, and the instructions call him to do a, a number of different things, one of which is to mobilize angry uh, frontiersmen in Kentucky who are frustrated that they don't have access to the Mississippi River and blame the federal government for not negotiating good uh, access rights to the Mississippi River, that Mm -hmm. the French believe that these frustrated frontiersmen will actually renounce their allegiance to the United States, swear allegiance to the French Republic, and invade Spanish Louisiana so that they can have access to the Mississippi River. And so Genet has these instructions, and he meets André Michaud soon after arriving in town and realizes, wow, I've got the scientist who wants to travel out west. Maybe I can send him out west where he's pretending to conduct botanical research, but in reality is going out to Kentucky to mobilize these angry frontiersmen to invade Spanish Louisiana, which, if they do, will completely upend geopolitics in North America. Uh, there, that's... there's a lot there. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a ton. There's a lot there. I think the the first thing is to talk about um, the current policy toward France and sort of Washington's reaction to. I think Genet, the, uh, Citizen Genet, is how he's always referred to. I think people may have heard that. Um, yeah. How he he's initially sort of seen as is a positive, but then his reputation sort of goes downhill a little bit. Jay um, is a known person. Like he, we covered yeah. him in, you know, a classic, you know, history, American history curriculum. Like he gets, but the Genet affair, I think gets talked about in non-specifics that exactly. he was mobilizing citizens towards the, you know, the interests of France is kind of as deep as you get. Right. This is a crazy specific, specific yeah. <laughs> um, uh, with what he was uh, trying to accomplish. Cause yeah, Louisiana, um, I mean, New Orleans is an incredibly important port. Like the, the bottom mm-hmm. of the uh, uh, of the Mississippi is is huge, and right now Spain is in control of it, like you said. Yeah. So, I mean, this is um, this moment. It, it's so um, it's so fragile. The Republic is so fragile, and, and Washington's trying to navigate it. And you know, foreign policy. This is his first major foreign policy crisis. Um, because what's going on in the in the larger context of Europe and the Western Hemisphere is 
as France is at war with Great Britain and Spain at the time. Uh, Spain is controlled by the Bourbon uh, monarchy, which is what the French had been before they were deposed. And Washington realizes, and, and France is calling on the United States, hey, we supported you during the American Revolution. You've got to support this sister revolution. Right. Washington also realizes Great Britain it controls a lot of the forts in the Northwest and is this you mm-hmm. know, global superpower. And Spain is in control of Louisiana. And if he were to intercede in this war, it's possible that he could face an invasion from Great Britain. Uh, there could be uh, Native American nations who uh, also invade right. or try and seize back land. Uh, and then there right. is the Spanish. And so Washington mm-hmm. says the only path forward for the United States is neutrality. And this is a great right. frustration to France. And that's why Genet is tasked with mobilizing Americans to oppose Washington's policies, which is foreign interference in American politics. It is a massive hmm. headache for George Washington. He believes this is a kind of a betrayal of international norms. Now, add to that this secret instruction to mobilize Americans to invade Spain. And the French strategy on this is that if a bunch of people from Kentucky, even if they renounce their allegiance to the United States and swear to the French, invade and seize New Orleans, the Spanish and the British are going to see this as an act act of the United States and force Washington into this war against his will. So this is a major threat to the Washington administration and the United States. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say, and to the nation, because there's no way the United States could survive another war at that point. It was just too fragile. They didn't have the money. It it was not going to go well. We start another war, the United States is done. Like, that's it. We're, we're going to become English again or Spanish. Is there any intertwining between this? So he said he's he's going under the pretense of doing this botanical work. Was anyone else aware of what he was up to, or is it this completely sort of isolated within him and Janae and the, the, these French nationals. Well, yeah, you know, that's where things get really interesting. If you think of it interesting mm-hmm. so far, this is where, you know, Thomas Jefferson is well aware of Andre Michaud. Thomas Jefferson mm-hmm. right. is also a great supporter of the French Revolution. And he and Janae become fast friends, even though Janae uh. is Washington's biggest headache. And mm-hmm. so... As Janae is forming this plan, he meets secretly with Thomas Jefferson and tells him what he intends to do. And remember, Thomas Jefferson is not just vice president of the APS. He's also secretary of state in the Washington administration. And you know what Jefferson does? I hope not nothing, because that would be treason, would it not? (laughs) No. No, it's correct. He doesn't do nothing. He actually writes a letter of introduction for Andre Michaud, explaining that he's a great botanist studying the natural world. And so Michaud, when he travels out west, now has a letter of introduction from the Secretary of State saying that he is traveling under the guise of science. And Jefferson, I, so audio only listeners can't tell, I'm sweating. Right now, I'm like I'm I'm actually perspiring, just being stressed out at this <laughs> at this because that is an a, a like a, a remarkable um, a, a event I, to have occurred. So like, Jefferson knew that he had he had met with Michaud and Michaud and and Jean- he was aware of what was going on as far as the machinations of the nation of France. He was helping the French government essentially. Yeah, he was helping that is, Michaud spy for the French government. Um, almost unbelievable. I'm I'm shocked. <laughs> That's a wild, wild story. Yeah, yeah. So, so Michaud, he he's heading down, and he's got this letter from Jefferson saying, "No, he's legit. Don't worry." When in fact, he's a spy. So, so what happens next? Yeah. Um. So I should, in Thomas Jefferson's defense, um, say that. You know, he, he warned Janae off. Um, he said along the lines that, you know, you should not enlist Americans um, in this project. But if you can have other people, perhaps Native Americans do it, he wouldn't be too opposed. <laughs> but nonetheless, okay. um, <laughs> oh my God. You, you do have the Secretary of State aware 
of this going on not informing the administration he's serving. I mean, I, it's almost right. like if the Secretary of State yeah. knew when Russia was going to invade Ukraine and decided not to say anything. It's, it is a very challenging moment uh, in terms of Jefferson and, and his decision making. Um, I talk a lot more about it in the book to try and put it in the context of the moment to explain perhaps, you know, Jefferson's thought process on it, because uh, I think it is a little bit more complicated. Um, and I don't know that I would go as far as to say it's treasonous. It's definitely mm-hmm. understandable if you put it in the context of that moment and all of the, the, the burgeoning party strife that's happening alongside, you know, Jefferson yes. trying to figure out what his role is as a um, figure uh, of both the opposition as the secretary of state, you know, how the republic's going to work, how this government's going to work. You know, so some of it is, I think, Jefferson going through the process of understanding you know, his place and and his responsibility. So it's it's a very complicated right. story. And, um, I, you know, trying to flesh it out was, was a lot of fun. So so what happens with Michaud is that he heads out west with these letters of introduction, including letters of introduction also from a senator who in some ways was even perhaps more uh, aware of what was happening than, than Jefferson himself. And hmm. he's able to mobilize. We have reports of 2,000 Kentuckians who are ready to invade Spanish New Orleans. And one of the heroes of the American Revolution, George Rogers Clark, renounces his allegiance to the United States, swears his allegiance to the French Republic, takes up as commander in chief of this expedition. They have their own uniforms. They begin building their own boats. They acquire cannon. Everything is looking like this invasion is going to happen. And that's a lot of people. Yeah, that's at that think, time. <laughs> that's yeah, that's substantial. Yeah. Um, you know, even in, given in, in proportion to the forces that the Americans could muster at the time, uh, you know, the official army. Um, that's right. a lot of that's a lot of uh, of of armed men. Um, yeah. So, so, sorry, I'm still <laughs> I, I understand that you you're you, you put it in context and that, you know, it, uh, uh, Jefferson's uh, 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 perspective on um the you know like what was in the best interest of the united states mm-hmm. and putting it into context i understand you do that in the book it's just not very often that you learn something brand new about a president uh, especially one of the first like you know one of those guys and something fresh mm-hmm. about them and and and, it, and this is um you know it's it's very cool to try to wrap your head around you know a, a kind of an unexplored episode yeah, uh, yeah. especially during this era yeah and I, you know i tried to um document it i, I couldn't do it as extensively as i'd hope but you know, how many biographies of Jefferson that are eight, oh 900 gosh. pages long and tend to be exhaustive don't yeah. really talk about this episode, you yeah. know, like I mean, a footnote. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit <laughs> back behind where we are on the timeline because <laughs> yeah. I'm still thinking about that. But um, so he's able to muster these troops. Is, he, is any of their efforts successful besides stirring um, those folks and, and successfully identifying a point of pain for those frontiersmen? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> that they would, would, you know, be um, inclined to try to assert uh, better access to the Mississippi. Um, were they were they successful in any incursions? Well, so everything is going along uh, swimmingly. I mean, there's some concern about do they have enough funding? Do they have enough uh, ammunition? Um, but what's remarkable is, is, is for a good period, uh, a few months, um, the federal government isn't fully aware yet. Um, and then there's a Spanish spy. So Janae ends up sending out some reinforcements uh, to Kentucky. Uh, Michaud goes out, he, he raises, he re- returns to Philadelphia. While he's returning to Philadelphia, Janae also sends some reinforcements. And one of those uh, men turns out to be a Spanish spy. And he alerts the Spanish uh, about these plans. And the Spanish then al- alert the United States. And they alert the United States via Thomas Jefferson, who gets to control <laughs> the information. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and, and Jefferson has to send all the letters to the governor of Kentucky, warning him off, telling him that, that he should not do this, that, in fact, the governor should uh, tamp this down, that this betrays uh, kind of the policies of the United States and, uh, and, and so forth. And so eventually, um, uh, you know, the, the federal government is able to intercede and really assert their authority um, and, and for me, what, what, what was another, the truly undiscovered part of, I think, this episode is that it really raised a question about citizenship. 
in the United States. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not what I, so much of this I didn't expect when I started this research project. But what I realized uh, was that, you know, the, those in Kentucky had to justify their actions. And this mm -hmm. is the early days of the Republic and the early days of the ideas of citizenship. What are the limits of citizenship? What are the duties right. and obligations of a citizen? Those are the questions. And those in Kentucky who wanted to support this invasion said that citizenship ended at the country's borders, that if they left the United mm -hmm. States and they renounced their allegiance mm -hmm. to the United States, they were free to do whatever they wanted. And it didn't reflect back on the United States. And the Washington said, well, this is madness. This means that a group of angry Americans could just cross the Mississippi River and invade a country uh, with whom we're, you know, an ally with, or at least at peace with. Right. Right. Um, and so Washington and Congress end up passing a law that clarifies that citizens are bound by the policies of the United States and they cannot launch in incursions or insurrections like this. Um, so hmm. this episode really raised a fundamental question about citizenship. Right. That's there's an interesting tension there in that perspective about citizen and citizenship and loyalty to your country with the loyalty that um, that that Michel felt to mm -hmm. France, right? Because mm -hmm. you know the government that he's working for for this is not the government that was employing him, right? Because he was the you know a, 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 the, the royal botanist that. Uh, Crown no long is no longer in charge of the country when he's going through this, but obviously he still felt like that's such an interesting differentiation um, between the connection to the country that you're from um, uh, and and the loyalty to it. But that's uh, those are all fascinating themes. Um, well, and we think about the explore. time period. I think if you think about that today and say the government has to tell you that you can't leave your country <laughs> and just like invade another one because it will in fact impact the US. But these people experienced the American Revolution. I mean, there might have been some veterans from the American Revolutionary War in this group. So they just experienced sort of pushing off the the largest empire in the world to create a new nation. And so they certainly would have a different mindset than later generations. Hmm. So I think it's it's interesting to remember that too, why they're they're thinking the way they are because of what they've experienced in their lifetimes. Yeah. So this this is an interesting moment for for the country. Um, you know, here was the the first democratic revolution, um, and what was its legacy going to be? What did what did it mean? And there was this great debate that was happening uh, among. Americans on whether or not the United States was staying true to its revolutionary principles. Um, there are some people who believe that it had actually backtracked, uh, was aligning more with British principles and ideas. And then there are others that saw the French Revolution as continuing the spirit of the American Revolution, in fact, staying truer to the American Revolution's principles. And that's one of the things that is motivating some of those in Kentucky, but also is really kind of a, a nationwide debate, which is, what is the meaning of the American Revolution? How does that influence our policy, our beliefs, and our actions? Yeah, those are all pretty big themes that are really great to talk about. And, and I think very relevant um, today when we're talking about the interplay between, you know, the, the national good and what's, what's in the best interest of the country um, versus the things that are in tension with it. Um, uh, that's really awesome. so. In your book, how does how does Michaud's like story button up? How does this 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 saga yeah. end? So so as I said, Michaud's life is one of being buffeted from one place to the next, uh, struggling with funding and, and having to follow the whims of his funder. So eventually, um, you know, after this conspiracy kind of just it, it really does just peter out, um, which has been an interesting part mm -hmm. of a you know you kind of when you're writing this book, here's this incredible conspiracy that could transform the country, and then it just kind of, you know, just it really it just kind of peters out uh, because of the intervention mm. of Washington. The, this, this, the stern intervention of Washington just kind of had everything go away. But there are legacies. Uh, there are legacies in the polit political culture of Kentucky that I talk about. Um, but for Michaud, um, he actually uh, uh, is able to escape any real scrutiny. I think Jefferson kind of protects him because if Michaud uh, is found out, then maybe Jefferson's involvement will be too. Um, 
So anyways, nobody uh-huh. ever realizes Michaud had any major part of this uh, conspiracy. Um, it's the other agents that are kind of take the brunt of, of the administration's ire. So Michaud continues to do botanical uh, research. Uh, he probably covers more ground in North America than anybody in his um, generation. Uh, and then he never gives up hope on this Western expedition to the hmm. Pacific Ocean. He believes that is his hmm. destiny. Now, all of his friends in North America, they support him, but they say, look, Andre, that is a really risky expedition. You might not ever return. And so you owe it to yourself, but more importantly, you you owe it to science to publish all of your findings, all this work that you've been Hmm. holding on to. You have to preserve it for posterity. So before you go out west where you may die, you may never return, you got to go back to France and you've got to publish this stuff. And so that's what Michaud ends up doing. And he travels back to France. He almost dies in this crazy shipwreck, but he's able to not only save himself, but the bulk of his research, they're carried in these large trunks and these herbariums. He's able to save them. And then he spends several years trying to publish and he really struggles with it. He doesn't have money. There's the French Revolution going on. And eventually another opportunity presents himself, an opportunity to go to Australia to conduct original botanical research. Really, huh. Michaud's heart is not in publishing. It's, it, it's, he's a, he has wanderlust. He wants to travel around sure. and discover new things. So at, yeah. in his 50s, he signs up for this expedition to go to Australia. He goes around the uh, uh, continent of Africa. He's near Madagascar. And, you know, he realizes that this expedition, it's, it's doomed. And so he hops off the boat uh, and uh, ends up uh, conducting botanical research uh, in Madagascar in the Indian Ocean mm. uh, and dies in Madagascar, probably of malaria or some other uh, oh. local endemic disease that he couldn't fight off. And so Michaud, hmm. uh, his, his body is um, buried in Madagascar. His, his grave site was rediscovered in the 20th century by some botan- uh, um, botanists who were there and were dedicated to trying to discover where uh, Michaud was, was buried. Oh, wow. So that's kind of the, the end of Michaud's story. But, you know, there, there are all these other hidden legacies. And my, and my book talks about all the ways that this expedition, failed expedition, and Michaud himself continued to influence things into the 19th and even 20th century. So this just made me think of a modern day conspiracy and just your thoughts on it. Do you think the fact that they were... That of course, Jefferson was trying to cover this up. So the story didn't come out that it might have been quite a while back that the document you initially showed us, why it wasn't discovered, that perhaps it was hidden away for that reason? Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, uh, I'd love to be able to say that's yet another. Oh. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> no, because actually the, 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 the text was known. Uh, if, and oh, it just was the document. It was the original with the signatures uh, was thought to be lost. <laughs> I was hoping there was another another conspiracy. Yeah. There, but that's OK. As far as Michaud's um, story coming to I, I it, it seems, you know, a serendipitous place for a botanist to end up at rest in Madagascar, yeah. given the local ecology and how much of how much he must have been able to explore there at the end of his life. Uh but, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, there, there are some indications that Michaud, you know, if, if he hadn't uh, got stricken, um, his, he was probably going to stay at Madagascar and try and produce a botanical garden there that would serve the same purpose that the one in North America did. Um, I think he was overwhelmed by the biodiversity there. Yeah. He died yeah, doing it, what he loved. So, I mean, yes. I think that's a positive yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so I think the, the final question I want to ask is, after writing this book, and learning this story, did it change your viewpoint of either, you know, politics during Washington's um, terms or the 1790s? Or did it did it change your views at all of this era or did it sort of reinforce what you already thought or knew? Yeah, that's a great question. I guess my answer would be that it, it's a little bit of both, if I can have uh, have it both sure. ways. Sure. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, the, the, the party strife, uh, which is a big part of the story we didn't really delve into, um, that really emerges um, mm-hmm. during the Janae affair when Janae's here. That's kind of the origins of a lot of party behavior where people are siding mm-hmm. with Janae in the French Revolution and, and those siding with Washington and his administration. And, and this, this is a window into that story that, that I was familiar with. 
you know, and the conspiracy in Kentucky um, was uh, really foreign to me. But I think more than just the event itself, it really is how fragile uh, and uncertain the, the the republic was. I mean, the, the right. government was sitting on very fragile foundations, and and the very meaning of citizenship was very much in flux. Um, and that things could have gone very, very differently, very easily. Um, you know, one of the things that comes out in this story is that the Spanish, when they learn of this potential invasion, acknowledge that their forces are so weak in New Orleans that it's almost certain that this kind of quasi ragtag group of Kentuckians would most likely be successful. And oh so that's God. how, you know, the uncertain, the geopolitics really is in North America at this time. And, mm-hmm. and the extent of that, I think, was was new to me. I think I think that's great, because for me, I I mean, I've always heard, I've always read and I knew that early on it was, you know, a very fragile republic. But I think your book really hits it home to give you an actual example that you can think about and say, this is an example of this fragile republic and what how close we came, how very close we came to something completely different happening than what, you know, we've lived out to today. So that's what I appreciated a lot about the book. Um, so uh, for our listeners, is there any place where they can um, uh, one, you know, follow any of your work? Are you doing any talks? Um, have you um, written anything um, besides re- uh, purchasing and, uh, and taking a look at the book? Um, where can they follow your work? Yeah, no, I'll, I'll be making the rounds. Uh, uh, the book actually launches September 17th. Um, so that's the, the launch date. I am giving an a early launch event at both uh, the American Philosophical Society here, September 4th, and Monticello, uh, September 10th. And then after that, I'm going to be in oh. New York in October uh, and lining up some other places uh, in St. Louis, in California, in Virginia, uh, several places in Virginia, as you can imagine, with, with, with Jefferson. So yeah, um, just uh, stay tuned, uh, and I hope you all will find the book as fascinating as as it was for me to both research and write. It was probably uh, the most fun. Uh, you know, this is now I guess my fourth book. Um, it was the most fun to research and write because it was like every I was I, I felt like I was every turn I took I was following the show, and every turn there was something new and unknown to me. And it changed as Lynn asked. It, it changed some of my perceptions of the early republic. And it's like that reading it too. It's, I mean, it has this sense of drama and, you know, it's, it's not your normal academic book. That's my pitch for it. <laughs> I didn't want it to be. <laughs> right. So be sure to check it out. The, uh, a link to purchase the book once it is available will be in our show notes um, mm-hmm. as well um, links to where we can, uh, you can go check out. Um, any of Spiro's talks that are coming yeah. up in the, in the in the lead up to that. And as always, this conversation was brought to you by our supporters over on Patreon. So if you really enjoyed this and would uh, like to support future conversations with historians and authors, please go to patreon.com slash primary source media where you can get early access to our content and some uh, book giveaways with signed copies of the books from the authors that we've interviewed. So be sure to check that out. Um, thanks again, uh, uh, Spiro, for being here. And yes, uh, thank you know, you so sharing much. this re- remarkable story with us. Yes, thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. It was great fun.